everybody, Scout Crafty here again, Mishmash Monday. Hope you had a great weekend. Uh, today started off a little wonky for me. I was uh, mowing the lawn and got stung by two yellow jacks. <laughs> you know the yellow jacks, those wasps that really serve no purpose other than just being a pain in the neck. And what was funny was I was thinking to myself, I was like, you know, there's two ways that you see people removing wasp nests and... Uh, and the first way is the people that are doing it because they see it there and they figured maybe it's time to get rid of this in case somebody gets stung. And the second way you see them removed is the guy that's already been stung. Totally different approaches to that. Have you ever been stung before? And I bet you remember most of your stings. Isn't that funny? I can remember the last time I was stung in 1984 and uh, in boot camp. I remember that. Like it was yesterday, and, and you know, you, you remember every time you get stung, it's kind of a, a weird thing. Anyway, a uh, couple things to get to today. Let's get started right away. Last week, my good buddy Resto Rob sent a, uh, a nice box of goodies over, and in it was uh, some of these bits. These are machinist bits, and, uh, and I mentioned center drills, and I said everybody should have a center drill. And my good buddy Chuck out there, friend of the show, said... Uh, could you explain what a center drill is? And, and I said, you know, we always pick up new subscribers and, and it's always good to just go over that real quick again. And, and I want to touch real quick on a center drill, what they are. Uh, of these bits here, these here are considered center drills here. And uh, these are my go-to center drills that I use all the time. I, these are the basic ones, you know, that this size I kind of use most of the time. I also have larger ones. But uh, center drills, once I found out what these are, they became, I, I use them all the time. Now, I did mention these <clears throat> last week. I mentioned that these are like a center drill. I've never seen these before. And I'm hoping, I know we have, sometimes we have machinists or people in the know that watch the channel Maybe you could tell me. At first, when I first saw this, I thought it was just a different type of center drill that wasn't double-ended. Usually, they're double-ended, meaning <clears throat> they have both sides. You know, you can use either one. Uh, these here, I thought, were single side. But when I look close, this is a slightly tapered shank. All of these even have a slightly tapered shank. I measured it. And they're definitely tapered. Now, you don't put a tapered shank in a collet. And you don't put a tapered shank in a, a chuck. So I was like wondering, what is what are these used for? So please, if there's any machinist out there or tool and die maker that knows why you would have a slightly tapered shank instead of a straight shank on here, let me know. I, I really appreciate that. Let's get to talking about regular center drills. Now, there are many different styles of this type of drill. In fact, uh, they also have something called a spot drill, which looks like this. But today we're gonna be talking about the standard center drill or combined countersink, whatever you wanna call it, step down. And this was developed years ago because if you look at the shoulder here, the angle of that shoulder, th it matches this point here. And this point here is called a live center. And they call that there because it goes into your tailstock when you're using something on the lathe. And they call it a live center because this one spins. There's a bearing in there. If you just had one without the bearing, it would be called a dead center. Okay, so that's the difference. But it's still a center. And they call it that because when you support work on the lathe, you want to drill a hole into your piece so that this cone cuts that 60 degree slot, which this will fit right in and support your work. Now, I just took this drill and drilled this into here. You see, I just drilled that into there on the lathe and you could see that's what it leaves you. That's what it looks like. And you could see if we were to put, this was a long rod and we needed to support one end, we would put this uh, live center into the tailstock. And when you push this in here, you see how that fits? That is snug, it's not moving. And uh, now if you didn't have a live a bearing, you would put a dab of grease in there against the uh, dead center and it would spin on the dead center. But that's how you hold it. And that's what this double-ended 60 degree uh, center drill was originally developed for. Let me show you how everybody else uses it for all different things. Okay, let's talk about one scenario here. Let's say you're trying to drill a hole in the corner of this can. You wanna make a weep hole down here, all right? 
So we put a, a small drill bit into the drill press and we're going to try and uh, drill a hole in that side. And you'll notice what happens a lot of times is the drill bit will start to walk or wander on the surface. You can see here, because it's spinning, it can't really get a good purchase or cut into the material. It's so thin that it's wobbling around on top of the surface. Now that's where the center drill really shines because notice this thin wobbly uh, cross section of the uh, regular drill compared to a center drill, how thick and stout and rigid that is. Let's perform the same operation using the center drill. also use it as a countersink a countersink will make your flathead screws become level with the surface you can use it for that now you can use it for many different things but remember one thing the flutes and that's these cutaways here they only go up to this point here so if you wanted to use this as a regular drill and drill past this point it'll get clogged up because there's nowhere for the chips to escape so it's made for shallow holes, but because it's so stout, it's very good so that your drill bit doesn't walk or wander. So that's what we use these for, and that's why you need to get a set because you won't regret it. Okay, next up, I just want to share a purchase uh, that I just picked up the other day. This here is uh, goes into your trailer hitch of your vehicle, and it's meant to uh, pull um a variety of different items you could see it has a shackle here and, and you could pull the, uh, ropes you could pull a cable you can pull anything and that's what it's made for now i have one in my truck now but that one is a hook instead of having a shackle it's a hook and it works great the problem is that if you should slack off with the truck let's say you're pulling and you back up a little bit the rope could pop off the hook so i needed one with a shackle where the line is captive and can't come out. This here, I was looking around at different ones, and this is uh, this is why I'm bringing this up because it's so funny when we look on Amazon and things like that. We tend to you know shop around, try and get the best buy. There was a bunch of these on there, and a lot of them are rated at these ridiculous numbers. You see, thirty-five thousand pounds, fifty-five thousand pounds, and. They're all made in China, of course, and you sit there and you go, man, and then you look at this one here. This is a Kurt. Kurt is made in the United States. This thing is solid forged steel, weighs just under 10 pounds. It's a heavy item for this little thing, right? And you can see here it says they rate it at 13,000 pounds. The reason is because Kurt and a lot of other reputable American companies or anywhere that's reputable, will rate it at working load, okay? The Chinese rate this at breaking load. Now, we both, we all know that this solid piece of forged steel is gonna hold more than 13,000 pounds, right? I mean, it's obvious. God knows what the breaking uh, strength of this would be. It'd be at least probably five times that, but they put on there, that's what the working load is. In fact, that 13,000 pounds would probably uh, rip off my, my trailer hitch before, cause I'm only rated for like 5,000 tow pounds. So it would, it would, you know, there's no sense. So that's what I'm trying to get at is when you're looking on Amazon, forget the numbers because the, it's all, they're all tricking you with these numbers out there. You know, you got to go by a reputable company. And the other thing is, you know, this is solid with no gimmicks. If you see one that swivels back and forth and stuff, anytime you have a swivel, it's going to take away from the rigidity and the strength because it has to have the ability to swivel. This is a solid piece of steel. If you want a vertical, it's got another hole here. You could put it in vertical. So just something interesting. But let me show you something else which I thought was interesting. Okay, the other day we were talking about pulleys and snatch blocks and I, you know, my fascination with them. Well, when I was looking for that Kurt receiver hitch, uh, I found this here. And uh, this is called a recovery ring. Now, this is something new to me because they didn't have this 10 years ago when I was doing a lot of recovery work. This is a recovery ring. Basically, what it is, it's a anodized uh, high-strength aluminum ring. And instead, now we all know a snatch block and a pulley is used that the rope goes around. This is the same thing. It's supposed to be lightweight, 
they're all using it now, all the recovery guys. And how this works is, this is called a flexible shackle here. And it's synthetic rope. It's rated for a lot of weight, more than the ring is. So you take this synthetic rope, you pass it through here like this, okay? And then it's got kind of, it's, it's braided in a way that you could slip this knot through there. And that's how you secure it, okay? Once this tightens up, this won't come off. You have a little sleeve here, a nylon sleeve. You put this here. Now, you would take your tree saver, and that's nothing more than a nylon strap that goes around the tree so you don't rip the bark or damage the tree. You put that tree saver around the tree, and you put it, attach it to here, okay? So this is attached to the tree, more or less. And then you have your synthetic line. It's not made for cable. You have your synthetic line run around this, and it spins on here, you see? Or the line could spin in here, whichever has less friction, but it'll most likely be the line spinning in here. And that's used, that's the pulley. So, like I said, this has been the big thing now. I always prefer a bearing snatch block, but it's also five times the weight. Any of you guys ever used one of these? Anybody's ever seen one? This is new to me, and we'll get to demo it when we take that tree down upstate. So, what do you think of that? Next up, the last time I went to the Long Island Tool Meet, I picked up these two items. I didn't mention it because these are future projects, but I would like to show them to you. Maybe uh, just do a, a light cleaning before I store them away for, again, their future projects. I don't know if you've ever seen these before. Some of you have, know exactly what they are. Absolutely fantastic item. These are called speed reducers, okay? Now, we all know with a regular AC motor, which is the motor that we use for our grinders and buffers, they run at specific RPMs, which is determined by your current, your hertz that's coming into the house or whatever, the windings, things like that. So usually they're either slow speed of 1700 RPM and, or fast speed 3200 RPM, something like that. That's the way they run. You can't variable, you can't slow them down because if you do, you, you, you lose all your torque and everything. They're meant to run at that speed. So they had, they invented these speed reducers. And what these do is there's a, like a worm gear in there. There's all kinds of cool gearing in here. So when I turn this, like this one here, if you read it here, <clears throat> tells you the torque reading, the RPM. This one here is a 25 to 1, it's written on here, which means every time I turn this wheel 25 times, this will turn once, okay? This is a 50 to 1, because it's written on there. So that means every time I turn, which one is it, this one? Yeah, this one. Every time I turn this one 50 times, this thing will go around once. And you say, well, what would you use that for? Well, that's what's so interesting. You know, you ever see like garage door openers, the ones that when you pull into a garage and they hit the button and it goes and raises the door. Well, that is done usually, uh, usually a couple different ways, but a lot of times it used to be done with speed reducers because they had a regular motor, an AC motor. It turned on and it turned it slow enough that the door wouldn't fly off the hinges. It would just raise, you know. So isn't that cool? Let's clean it up, see if I could demo one of these. Okay, now we have no idea when the last time this was run, so I'm sure it's not up to spec as far as fluid goes. You saw the outside, how bad they look. So what I'm going to do here, this is the seal over here, and I'm going to lubricate this with some light oil. I'm using Zoom Spout. It's a light oil. And that'll penetrate, if there's any rust or anything, that'll get in there for when we turn it, just to demonstrate it. And I'll do the same to all the shafts. Okay, here are the two speed reducers with the, uh, the rust and grunge and everything removed. Uh, I also opened up the ports here. Now, you see here, there are uh, on the bottom here, you have like a top level and a bottom level. This should be filled with a type of gear oil. It's very specific to these type. Uh, I didn't want to put any gear oil because I'm going, if when I do the restoration, I'm going to drain it all. So what I did is I just put some, because I'm sure it's low level. I put some mobile one in there just to s s kind of uh, loosen things up because I'm not going to be running it for any extended amount of time. I just want to get all that old oil mixed up and out of there so when I change it, it'll, it'll drain out easy. And then you saw what I did with the seal. So all the uh, seals been lubricated. Let's hook it up 
uh, to I have a, my Milwaukee Magnum hole shooter. Let's put it on the shaft and watch how these things work. Okay, now this one is 24 to 1, even though it said 25 to 1. It says 24 to 1 on the label. Let's check this one out. Okay, now this unit is 50 to 1, so that means that uh, this shaft is going to turn much slower than the other one. So the first thing to pay attention to is the RPM of the drill and the RPM of this shaft. ask you could you see any use for this in your particular shop or any projects you might do and uh these things are pretty pricey as far as price goes if you bought this new these units would be uh quite expensive i paid uh five dollars each for each one of these so what do you think so in closing uh that was a lot of fun down here today let me know in the comments if you know anything about those tapered shank countersinks i showed in the beginning and also, let me know if you've used any of these uh, speed reducers in your shop or anything or at where you work or if you ever had any contact with them. Very interesting, aren't they? Hope you have a great day. We'll see you again on Wednesday. Take care now. Bye-bye.